Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for a new webinar uh, from Flat World Languages and FFLA. So now let's go to the webinar for today, which is titled Strategies to Maximize the Interpretive Mode. And this is done by us with FFLA, as we mentioned, this is a collaboration. And this webinar is part of a series of webinars where we will explore the different strategies to abort the standards. That being said, I would like to present our speaker for today, who is Linda Villadoniga. So Linda received a master's in education from Middlebury Institute in Monterrey, California. She is the department chair and chair of advanced international certificate of education program at San Agustin School. She's recognized as the teacher of the year by FFLA and she serves as president of the association as well. She is an active presenter at local, regional, national, and international levels. Uh, we want to highlight her active roles in the Florida chapter of AATSB as conference coordinator, state poster, contest coordinator, and editor of La Voz newsletter. And not only this, but she was also the recipient of the AATSB Distinguished Leadership Award. Thank you very much for being with us, Linda. The floor is yours. Hey, welcome everyone. I uh, want to welcome you to the first of a series of six webinars that we will be doing, each one discussing a different um, standard. I want to tell you that the Florida standards are based on the ACTFL standards, so they are applicable to any language. Um, you just may have to make adjustments as needed, but they are applicable to every language or at least I, almost every language, if not every. So what are we going to see today? First, we're gonna talk about what the interpretive mode is. And then what are the Florida standards for the interpretive mode? What strategies should we use? And how can we maximize those strategies? So bear all this in mind as we start going through. What does the interpretive mode mean to you and how do you incorporate incorporate it into your teaching practices? Use the QR code or the um, link at the bottom to open that and just take a minute or so to give us some answers and share your, um, your thinking about the interpretive mode, what it means to you, and also how do you incorporate it into your teaching practices? And we'll take 45 seconds or a minute to do that so everybody has a chance. And the next question, which will also take 45 minutes, 45 seconds or so, are what are the main challenges you encounter when incorporating the interpretive mode into your language teaching? And there's a link or the QR code that you can scan and just take a couple of seconds to jot down the challenges uh, that you have in an everyday class. I, th I think we can continue. Okay. So what is the interpretive mode? The interpretive mode, and this was taken right from ACTFL, I didn't reinvent the wheel. Uh, the interpretive mode focuses on the comprehension and interpretation of spoken, signed, and written language. The interpretive mode involves one-way listening, reading, and viewing, in which the learner engages with a variety of print and non-print materials. Visual lit literacy is also a critical 21st century skill. And by visual liter literacy, we're talking about infographics, uh, graphs, um, pictures, um, charts and that kind of thing. Very important because we're finding that students sometimes are not able to interpret what they see. Uh, they can interpret what they hear, they can interpret what they read, but they sometimes have difficulties uh, interpreting what they see. And yet, to me, those are the easiest things to interpret. But, oh, I think I skipped one, yes. Okay, so what are the Florida standards for interpretive mode? Again, I want to tell you that these uh, standards are based on ACTFL. So if your state, if, if there are people out of state here watching, if your state bases their standards on um, ACTFL, then you will have no problem at all uh, in integrating 
what we're talking about today. So standard one is that the student will be able to understand and interpret information, concepts, and ideas orally from culturally authentic sources on a variety of topics in the target language. And that's speaking, uh, that's listening and reading. There's no um, communication between the speaker and the listener. There's no communication between the writer and the reader. Um, so it's just interpretive. Standard two, interpretive reading. The student will be able to understand and interpret information, concepts, and ideas in writing from culturally authentic sources on a variety of topics in the target language. So basically, they're the same standard, just different focus. And visual literacy, as I said um, before. I already explained that, so I'm not going to dwell on that. So what strategy should we use for listening and reading at the novice range? And these are just some, there were, there are many, many more uh, strategies that you can use, some of which are obviously not on this list. But at the beginning, at the novice range, you introduce keywords, phrases, uh, and then practice them. And, and I know that, you know, you as a, as the teacher will sometimes feel like, oh my gosh, how many times do I have to say the same thing? Buenos dias, buenos dias, buenos dias, buenas tardes, buenas tardes, buenas tardes. Uh, but it's very important for the student to understand and to interpret what you're saying. Um, I saw someone one day, uh, which I had not thought of, but hey, it's a great, great uh, strategy. When she was at the door reading, greeting her students, she had a clock, you know, one of those clocks that you make up or you can buy on teacher discovery or whatever. Um, and she had a, a little box that said a.m. or p.m. and then she would set the clock and she would stand there with the, her clock and say to the student as they walked in buenos dias if it was before lunch or buenas tardes if it was after lunch and that gave the student um, a mental image of morning and afternoon so that was a different way of incorporating that even though they had heard it in class but sometimes when you're standing at the door and the classes change it's more appropriate to say buenos dias than buenas tardes so just that's just a little something extra that that was that I'm throwing in. Um, vocabulary charts are important. Think back to uh, third grade, fourth grade, when the students had a paper that had um, a, a box or a circle in the middle of the page. That was their vocabulary word. And they had to write a synonym, an antonym, use it in a sentence and give the definition. That is a standard vocabulary chart. It's still useful. Um, I volunteer in a third grade classroom, in several third grade classrooms now. The kids are using those still. They're very valuable. It was something I used in my own classroom when I was still teaching because the kids were used to doing that. And of course, you don't want to do it for every word. You want to choose your words carefully. Um, an example, like I was with a third grade group the other day, they were reading a story. Well, not every story was highlighted in the in the uh in the excerpt, but what the word, but the words that were were on the margin. So the students had maybe two sheets back and front um, of those words, and those are the words that they had to come up with the synonym, the antonym, the definition, and a sentence of their own. An added thing would be to add the sentence that's in the text, if it's if it's written, if it's reading, if it's reading comprehension. An SQA or a QWL chart access their knowledge about a topic. Um, that way they're the, the they have their mindset on what they're going to be listening to or reading about. Um, it, the, the K is the what they know, the W is what they want to learn, and the L is what they learned after reading or hearing. And SQA is the same thing. Lo que sé, lo que quiero aprender y lo que aprendí. Uh, the main idea tree, main idea can be very difficult for some students to pick out. Um, they just want to, you know, they they learned once upon a time that main idea is either at the beginning of the paragraph or at the bottom of the paragraph. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't, sometimes it's in the middle. Um, nowadays, they're calling it the main topic as well, not just the main idea. So that might be something else to think about. You will probably have to lead them through using these charts, especially at the beginning. Um, then they get more used to it and they do it on their own. I had students who I taught to use these uh, strategies 
as freshmen in Spanish one, and they were using them in AP at the end. So once they grab hold of these strategies and realize that they work as well in another language as they did in their language when they were studying in third and fourth grade, they're more apt to use them. So use them and abuse them as I would say, not the kids, use and abuse the, the, the strategies. The who, what, when, where, why, and how chart is more, it's a little more detailed um, and it works really well, maybe in conversations, especially because they're, they have a who, they have a what, there's a topic, when, maybe or maybe not, where, again, maybe or maybe not, and the why and the how. If they're listening to a, an audio clip or a watching a video clip, then that's a perfect place to use this. Um, and, a re and when they're reading, of course. Um, then they should list the keywords, actions, and characters. They should be able to do that after they've listened or read something once, twice, 30 times, however many times as it takes. These are not graded, by the way. You can check them to see if they've done it correctly, but I wouldn't grade them. Uh, draw a picture of what was heard or read. There's nothing quite like a visual um, something to, to connect. That's another square you could have in the uh, vocabulary chart, draw a picture. Not every word, of course, is, is illustratable. But if it is, it's a it's another connection that the student is making. They can match words to pictures. That puts a little bit more work on you uh, sometimes, but make it an assignment. Make it a fun assignment during the class period where they the kids have to draw different pictures for different words and then cut them and you know hand them out or whatever. And and kids, you know, they love to play games. So why not take advantage of that? Uh, pick out the central idea. Uh, they should be able to tell you what the general idea of the conversation, video, audio clip, or reading was. This is all for novice range. Now, they're not in-depth readings, not in-depth conversations, but uh, it certainly helps them to make connections. Uh, when they're in their intermediate range, which is levels one and two, depending on, you know, your school, um, and your class makeup. Again, you're going to use some of the same because you want to build on their receptivity to using these strategies, the vocabulary chart, uh, the SQA or KWL, the main idea tree, prediction chart. Um, there was a reading, and I don't remember the title of it now, but um, led the students to make predictions about what they thought the story was going to be about. You want to get their brains going and you want them to be able to make predictions. Sometimes they're right and sometimes they're wrong, depending on what the author had in mind. So it's not something that's going to work every single time favorably. Does this work? Yes, because they're practicing on making predictions. But will it work 100% of the time? No, um, certainly not. A uh, cluster web is another way of doing a vocabulary chart, the, the, and it works for, for topics as well. It's a circle in the center of the page with the topic or the vocabulary word, and then smaller circles all around it, um, maybe four or five, that have synonyms or uh, phrases that mean the same thing or that relate to that vocabulary word. You can do it with main idea and supporting details as well. Uh, that's a good way for them to break down the main idea and then break it up into supporting details. If there are several paragraphs, then it should be easy to, to, to fill in. The who, what, when, where, why, and how chart again. Sequencing chart. By now, they should be able to say primero, entonces, después, luego, finalmente. They should be able to put things in sequential order. And the Venn diagram, don't forget the the handy dandy friendly Venn diagram um, to compare and contrast ideas. These never go out of style. They've been around as long as I've been teaching and that's now almost 50 years that I started. So they've been around for a while. Uh, for the intermediate range again, uh, as they read or listen, students should be able to Restate information from short articles or an audio clip in their own words. We don't want plagiarism. 
It has to be in their own words. Why? Because then you can tell if they've actually understood what they've heard or read. They should be able to locate key information. If you ask them, mm, what is the name of the main character? They should be able to find that. Uh, where does the main character live? Where does the plot take place? What is the setting of the article? What does it talk about? They should be able to find that in a reading or if they're if it's a listening clip or a video clip, then it's a little easier video, a little maybe more difficult in listening, um, depending on how much practice you've given them with videos and, and audio clips. Uh, they can relate the main idea and add details. They should be able to describe the action in their own words, what happened first, what happened next, um, what happened at the end. Was it a surprise? Did their prediction come true? And then give main and secondary name, give the name of main and secondary characters, if there are any. If there aren't, there aren't. Um, advanced, again, advanced range, levels one and two. Uh, introduce keywords, phrases, and practice them. And be sure you practice them ad nauseum. Uh, kids learn by hearing and by reading and by seeing. So we need to do that. We can't just, even if they complain, oh, we're going to do this again. Yes, we are going to do this again. And then be sure you practice them. And then on the next day, when they come into class, greet them with a question. Uh, ¿Qué comiste hoy? ¿Qué quisieras comer mañana? Uh, ¿Te gustaría ir al cine? Anything that relates to the vocabulary you were studying. Uh, ¿Qué tiempo tenemos hoy? ¿Va a llover? Uh, ¿Llovió anoche? Whatever you, whatever it was that the topic was, incorporate that into uh, when they come in. And I know it's hard to do, you know, 30 plus students as you're standing at the door. So, you know, you don't have to hit every student with the same question either. You can vary your questions and you know your students better than anybody. So you don't want to embarrass anyone. You don't want to make anyone dislike answering questions. So adjust your questions to the level of the student, but vary them so that no one has, you know, no two kids in a row have the same question. If you don't get done at the door, that's fine. When they come in, you can ask questions during the period. So it's as long as you practice them with them and give them the opportunity to respond to you. Preferably, of course, don't use vocabulary that they don't know. Don't use structures. Don't, don't use structures that they don't know. Keep them uh, engaged. There's nothing worse than talking above a student, honestly. I mean, I don't like to be talked about. Um, I'd rather be talked a little lower and know that that person who's asking me a question knows what I can understand um, than feel like I'm being humiliated or chastised for not knowing something. So bear that in mind. Um, a lot of it is social and emotional at, for a student and learning a language is not easy, um, as we all know. So I would um, advise you to um, practice what you've studied in the classroom, make it a little challenging for the student who is up for the challenge, but bear in mind that a lot of the students, especially in the lower levels, aren't up for that challenge yet. They, they will let you know when they are, and you know who they are because you see them every day. Uh, so these are basically the same graphic organizers. Why? Because you practice them again and again and again and again. Are there others? Yes, I will repeat that. There are many other strategies and graphic organizers that you can use on a not daily basis. Um, you don't want the graphic organizers to be the teacher. You want them to, you want the graphic organizers to facilitate the learning. Excuse me. Uh, as they progress into the advanced levels, they should be able to discuss the main idea, discuss, now they're talking, uh, discuss the main idea and supporting details from what they've read or heard, summarize fiction and nonfiction articles, uh, audios, audio clips or video clips. And remember, a summary is a summary. It's not a retelling of every detail of the story. You can tell them, summarize, um, do it by paragraph. Summarize paragraphs one, two, and three and see what they come up with. You may have to adjust that. You may have to add or you may have to subtract the number of, of, of uh, paragraphs. But 
You know your classes, you know your students. Uh, analyze the main plot, subplot, and characters. And they're high school kids. They're probably doing exactly the same thing in their um, language arts class. So it should not be a new thing for them. Uh, compare and contrast cultural nuances. Um, if you have a video of uh, shopping in Spain, for example, a lot of the kids, and, and in a lot of Latin American countries as well, um, a lot of kids are shocked that there are still panaderias, carnicerias, verdulerias, fruterias, and people go from shop to shop buying um, the product of that particular shop. Are there supermarkets? Of course there are. But people, especially in the outskirts or in a smaller town, will go to their favorite vegetable grower, their, their grower seller, uh, fruit, um, meat, the butcher, the baker. Um, my sisters-in-law all have a special baker that they go to. They, they don't buy bread in a supermarket. They have a baker that they go to. Um, same thing with, with the, the meat and the fish. They go to La Pescaderia that they've known forever or La Carniceria that they've known forever. And that's what they do. But kids here are not used to that. I mean, how many butcher shops do you have in your area? I have two actually in St. Augustine, uh, which is really amazing. Um, but most kids don't know that there is a butcher shop or a bakery or whatever it is. So that's something that they could certainly compare and contrast. Did you notice, this is the question, did you notice where Fulanita went to buy bread today? Did she buy it at the supermarket? L ask leading questions so that they get the idea of what it is they're 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 trying to compare and contrast. Um, and of course, sequencing. They should be able to do that lickety split. This page shows you um, how, this is just an example of how uh, the standards, uh, the, the Florida standards in particular, but ACTFL standards uh, also, where you can find activities that highlight or pinpoint a specific um, standard. And these are available and you can see the link. It tells you where you can see the link. I mean, it shows you the link and you just click on it and you will go to um, this kind of chart for uh, the three levels that we have out in print right now. Level four will come out in June of 2024. There is a chapter that's available for preview. If you'd like to see that, just contact Clet directly. Hey, Linda, just... Please. Yes, just a quick thing. Uh, maybe before we continue, we could read yeah. some of the answers that oh, we got yes. from the Padlet. Yes, please. Yes, let's see if some of the examples here will help. So regarding the first question, right. So for the first question, what does the interpretive mode mean to you in the context of language education and how do you incorporate them? We have, for example, uh, French, infographics, videos, audios, text, and photos. There's someone who mentioned present I am presentation or oral responses simultaneously, listening to, to authentic sources, listening and reading in the target language, reading and listening activities, making meaning of both language and context of a text. Then someone answered the interpretive mode is a communication. We can assess it using actual standards, which helps reassuring beginners that they don't have to understand everything. Mm -hmm. And also that the interpretive mode is working with authentic resources and working with comprehension of the material. That's for the first question. And for the main challenges that you encounter when incorporating the interpretive mode, we have interpreting complex, sorry, complex language in authentic text. We have getting the students to want to read in the target language, to engage, then access to authentic resources and the time to create them, using the authentic resources with novice levels, determining the extent to which authentic resources should be left alone. Also to kids to feel confident, not only the engagement, but the confidence, uh, lack of motivation, the different language levels, and that students often say the audio or video is too fast as again. So maybe the 
lack of confidence or that they feel the material is too difficult? I'm going to uh, try to address that last one. Um, you can slow down an audio clip, and I would recommend that you do that um, at first because, because uh, reporteros, and, and that's the book we're, we're targeting today, because it uses authentic audios and authentic uh, readings, the speed at which a person, a native speaker speaks is certainly above the listening level of a student, a novice student. So slow it down, not so as, no, but slow it down a, a couple, you know, what I don't, um, I don't know what level you would do it for, but certainly slow enough so that the student can feel confident. And I heard that word several times and confidence is everything. If a student feels confident, he or she will participate a whole lot more than if he or she doesn't, or should I say they, I guess that's the politically correct term. Um, so slow down the audio and play it at that slow down speed a little, a couple of times, and then slowly increase the speed until you reach native speed. Um, and then once they get that, but on the other hand, when you are asking questions of the student, practicing the vocabulary that they've that supposedly studied, I'm not gonna say learned, but studied, um, then there's no need to to slow it down. I mean, how slow can you say buenos dias and sound authentic? You can't. Buenos dias, buenas tardes, hasta luego, uh, hasta pronto, whatever it is you're practicing, um, como te llamas, cuál es tu número de teléfono, things like that. You can slow down a bit, but if you slow down too much, you don't sound authentic. Um, so just that remember that you can you can slow it down a little bit especially if it's a, an audio clip um in your own personal speech and you're, you're re, and you're reviewing something i would not slow down too much if you're including a new word then you know emphasize that word maybe somehow um but don't slow it down because what you're looking for is for them to be able to understand a normal speed bearing in mind that different places speak faster or slower than other places in the Hispanic world. And that's the one I wanted to kind of stress there. Okay, so right now, as I said, we have, going back to the presentation, right now we have uh, Reporteros Uno, Dos y Tres available. And four, as I said, just coming out in June, 2024. Uh, there are correlations uh, for one, two, and three for the AP program and for the IB program, and hopefully soon for the Cambridge um, Advanced International Certificate of Education program. Uh, those will be available also so that you can see uh, where, what activities target what topic or theme or whatever it is, okay? Okay, so the student edition is divided into six units and each unit is divided into two lessons. Each lesson, or each, I should say, each unit consists of an introductory lesson and then lesson one and lesson two, and they are in integrated. I, um, not integrated in the sense that they're all one thing. Uh, there's a very definite lesson one and a very definite lesson two. Uh, but the introductory lesson for level one is your basic vocabulary, a very basic vocabulary. It starts off with, a, you, we're gonna show you a page in a minute. Um, just the basic stuff. For levels two and three, it's kind of like a review of the previous year or previous level, uh, just to get the kids back into the groove. Um, each lesson includes varied and various activities for each st standard, not just one, but many. Cultural components, obviously, because they're authentic materials. Authentic documents and resources. There's a mini project at the end of each lesson and a final project at the end of each unit that's planned out for you to use or not is up to you. Um, it does include most of the standards at some level so that you can check things off if you're in a, a district that requires that. Uh, grammar and vocabulary are introduced in context 
for the inductive learning, and then explicitly charts and graphs, et cetera, just the way we um, have taught in the past. But some kids are visual learners and they want to see those charts and they want to see those uh, infographics and, and things like that. So we have included those in the text. Uh, other components that are available, there's a workbook available, there's an annotated teacher's edition. Um, and then the greatest feature of all, I think, is the Spanish Hub. It's a digital platform and it has an interactive version of the student textbook and workbook. So students don't have an excuse for not doing a page uh, for homework, homework, um, if you assign it. they And they, oh my gosh, I forgot my book. Well, you know, you can go to the Spanish Hub and do it. Uh, it has audio files, videos, grammar tutorials, pronunciation tutorials, and so much more information. It's it's a wealth of information that is at your fingertips and included with the with the program. Okay, let's take a, a closer look at Reporteros Uno. Again, this is the first level. Uh, this is the the page, the opening page to lesson uh, unit one, lesson one. This is an, a unit overview. So this, and you can see there's a final project and there's too many projects. For lesson one, they're going to create a poster about an influential Latina or Latino. Um, timing couldn't be better since Hispanic Heritage Month is September 15th to October 15th. That falls right in. Uh, mini project number two, create a class album, photo album type thing, or like a, uh, what do you call that? Scrapbook. Um, and the, pro the final project is to interview a famous person for a talk show. And one of you plays the um, interviewer and the other student, uh, not you, sorry. One of your students is the interviewer and the other student is the uh, person. And then they switch roles. So obviously they get uh, the, the uh, practice in asking and answering questions. Um, and then this, this top, this unit has to do with La Reportera, whose name is Dana. And she is from the United States, but she is a Hispanic. So she talks a little bit about that. We talk a little bit about the country that is being focused upon and maybe the city, if that's important. Um, and then there's a video that you can watch or they, the students can watch, you can play and they can watch. And they fill in just the short answers down here. As, as Dana talks, you can jot down her name, her age, where she lives, what city she lives in, what country she lives in, what languages she speaks, and any other information that she gives. And that's, you can play the video, you know, more than once, of course. And then in pairs, they compare their work and watch the video again to verify their answers. Is that something you have to collect? No. If you want to, sure. Um, on this page, and we're, I'm showing you some pages so that you can see the examples. Uh, the first activity says, le escucha y escribe. So we're, we're targeting three standards, right? The reading, the listening, and the writing. Uh, and it's all, um, the, the listening and the, and the uh, reading is interpretive, of course, and the writing is presentational at this point. But again, it's vocabulary they know, and it's questions that they should be able to answer because you've practiced the vocabulary enough. Um, this is later on in the chapter. This is not the first, or unit, this is not the first activity they're doing. Um, so it says, observe the map, the floor plan of the school and read the questions or the uh, statements and which ones correspond to the image. So it says, hay una piscina. There's a swimming pool. Well, the kids can look at the chart here and determine that there is no swimming pool. Uh, la biblioteca está al lado del salón de computadoras. Well, they have to find the biblioteca, the library, and they have to find the, what was the other one? Salón de computadoras and say, yes, they are next to each other or no, they are not next to each other and on and on like that. They're looking, they're reading, so they're interpreting the reading, but they're also interpreting the visual image. Sort of like matching, um, and, but it gives them a crutch. They're not just reading something and having to read for comprehension. They can read the question or the statement and then determine if it's true or false or 
whatever you, you know, whatever they have to do um, by looking at a visual and that reinforces their confidence or it should. Uh, in part B, they're going to listen to a conversation and then they're going to uh, relate the words that are underneath. Um, or they're going to listen to a conversation and then look at the, the words that are in the purple boxes and show where they are on the map or floor plan. And then they have to write two, sim two similarities and two differences between their school and Juan Jose's school. So we're incorporating a lot of things in just one page. You've already hit three standards. Boom, boom, boom. Are they easy? Yes, this is beginning. So yes, they're fairly simple. Uh, they should be able to um, answer these questions without much trouble. And then exchange papers so that the kids can, can uh, talk about it. Um, exchange papers. I'm just going to take a parenthesis right here. And, and I don't know how many of you have ever used or heard of a cooperation clock. It is a godsend because you know how kids gravitate toward each other and they only want to work with that person. So to get a full learning experience, um, gosh, I don't even know how many years ago uh, it was, but I was at a conference or something and somebody pulled out what they called a cooperation clock. I had never heard of that, but I found it to be so useful that I used it every day in every class, ever the rest of the years that I taught. Um, and what it is, is very simple and have the kids make their own because if you give it to them made, then they lose it and you don't know, you don't know the answer to the questions you're going to ask. So the question you're going to ask is team up with your, or say, uh, team up with your two o'clock appointment. So how it works is you have a clock with the hours and every student there's 12 hours, of course. So what, student A will go to student B and say, I would like an appointment with you for 12 o'clock. Student A writes student B's name on his clock. Student B writes his name, the other student's number name on his clock. So that way they know who their partner is at 12 o'clock. Sometimes you gotta say it two or three times because kids being kids, they will write their own name on their own clock and that doesn't work and so on, and they fill in the 12 hours. Now, what does this do? It gives them a chance to work with at least 12 different people. Every quarter you can change it up. They have to choose a different person to work with so that by the end of second quarter, they will have worked with 20, well, 22 people, I guess, really. Um, but anyway, it gives you a chance to mix it up. So you would say, for this activity, I want you to work with your two o'clock appointment or your three o'clock. And I tried every day to keep it at least somewhere written down what hour I use with what class so that I would know to move ahead an hour uh, until all 12 were, were used. And then you can always go back. It's a really cute little thing. If they make their own clock, like I said, it's so much better because they tend to take better care of their clocks. I had a class though who was so bad about keeping things that I kept them in a folder, period one, period two, period three, whatever period it was. And then I pulled out the clocks and gave them out for that activity and collected them back. Okay. Um, this page, uh, these two pages um, are wonderful. It's a, you, you can read the, the, um, description of the person. And there's enough vocabulary there that they should be able to figure out who you're talking about. So if we look at A, it says, Hola, soy Gleibar Torres y mi cumpleaños es el 13 de diciembre. Soy de Caracas, Venezuela, soy deportista. What is the key word in that, in that uh, paragraph? I would say deportista, because they may not know who Gleibar Torres is. Um, may not know that Gleibar Torres is Venezolano, but you wouldn't know it from that from that description anyway. So then they have to guess. Okay, is it A? Um, could be, but they probably know who A is, or maybe not. Um, but it could be because she's she's a, a person involved in sports. It cannot be two, cannot be three, cannot be four, could be 
five, definitely not six. So we've narrowed it down to two, to one and five. Um, and, it, and that's all the clues you have right there. So you may have to um, read another one to, to uh, eliminate one. And let's go down to the one where you have to, the one that will help you. That's E. ¿Cómo están? Me llamo Lori Hernández. Mi cumpleaños es el 9 de junio. Soy de los Estados Unidos. Mi papá se llama Anthony y mi mamá Wanda. Soy de Puerto Rico. Mi actividad favorita es la gimnasia. By saying that their favorite sport is gymnastics, that eliminates five. So she must be number one. And number A or letter A is probably five. Teach them the tricks that they need to, to know to help them figure out because deportista does not necessarily mean it's a it's it's not a feminine word unless the person is a woman. La deportista, el deportista. Um, so that's not a clue, but help them learn. This is an activity I would do with them, first of all, because the nuances that are there. So choose the activities that you want to um, do with them and then choose the ones that you want them to do in pairs or in, even in groups. Uh, the next page is again, lee, habla y escribe. And uh, the same format, they're going to listen to something and then they're going to complete that little chart. Um, they're going to choose a person from the previous page and give information about them orally and or in written form. And then there's a couple more activities. There's a grammar box there so that they can see their vocabulary or there's a vocabulary box and then there's a grammar box. And these are things that they will need to know in order to um, answer the questions. But since this is new vocabulary, new grammar, they have given you, uh, Plet has put in reporteros boxes that will help the student uh, decipher what, what it is they're look, reading or listening to. If you have any questions at any time, just put it in the chat and Sabrina will uh, will let me know that there's a question and we'll answer it as best we can. Uh, the next yeah. one is, right? Yeah, sorry, no, yes. That, sorry, yes. I mean, we don't have questions so far. Just wanted to remember everyone that, yes, they can use the chat or the, ideally the Q&A. So please share as many questions as you like. And just also like a friendly reminder to anyone who's here, uh, rem remember that these are the examples for reporteros, but at the end of the slides, we're going to see also some examples for other languages, such as French. I mean, some people were mentioning if the examples were only in Spanish, so just so they know that we also will share Sp uh, examples for French and other languages. Right. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so then this is the next page. I, we wanted to give you samples of pages so that you would see to what extent reporteros has... Um, aligned the textbook with the standards. So I'm going to skip this because it's the same thing. And I see that we're down to 15 minutes. So I'm going to kind of speed it up, but you can, you will be able to see this whole PowerPoint in a week or 10 days or so, and you can stop and read it and analyze it. If I see something, oh, um, no, <laughs> excuse me, Reporteros Dos. Um, mis cosas favoritas. There is a um, a little video that I'm going to play for you, just briefly, so that you can get an idea of what this video looks like. Hola a todos. Soy Mateo. Y hoy les voy a presentar mis seis objetos favoritos. Algunos los tengo hace mucho tiempo y otros son casi nuevos, pero todos tienen algo especial para mí. Número seis. Un objeto importante para mí es este book. Okay, so you can see that it's very authentic. Uh, it uses the vocabulary of the unit or the lesson, and uh, it is at normal speed. So it also lets them hear a different accent. Oops, 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 oops sorry. Okay, uh, moving on, there's another... Um, video, but I think in the interest of time, we'll skip it. You can see how the pages are set up, um, the activities that, that there are, uh, and it will tell you at the beginning, mira y habla, so you're going to watch something and then talk about it, or responde a las preguntas, 
orally or in writing, and then compare something in this particular case. Oh, no. Okay. <clears throat> and then the double page, um, all kinds of activities again. Le escribe y habla. Um, responde. Busca los verbos en pretérito, based on the reading. Uh, escucha y habla. Escribe e, e interactúa. So we're seeing all kinds of activities. Uh, this is an, uh, an example of some authentic resources. Pioneers in, uh, 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 pioneers in igualidad, um, igualdad. Uh, uh, hmm. I know what it means. I know the words, uh, equality part, uh, pioneers. So people who fought for equality. Long way around to say it. Sorry about that. Uh, and they would read the two pages and then answer questions. Reporteros tres, of course, is more advanced. It's leading into AP. Um, so this is an excerpt from a story. Como conocí a mi mejor, a mi mejor amigo, amiga. They're going to read it, use the vocabulary charts, whatever you're using for the important vocabulary. And then re they're reading it, they're talking about it, they're justifying an answer. So they have to search for the supporting detail or whatever it is, and they're going to write something. A, a vast variety of activities that are recycled so that they become more difficult as time goes on. And another one, uh, again, uh, an authentic source. This one is from a book, El Cartero de Neruda, and they're going to read it and talk about it, write about it. There's a cultural box here in the corner. Another one. It's almost the same. And then because it's leading into AP, of course, we want the topics to be covered. Proteger a los animales salvajes, authentic resource. Reporteros Cuatro is not out yet, but this is a sample of Unit 1. Um, and it, it tells you what you're going to learn in the unit. Every, every book starts that way. Every unit starts this way with a double page telling you what introduces you to the reportero for that chapter and the country he represents. In this case, hola, me llamo Miguel y soy peruano de Lima. So the, the focus will be on Peru. You can see the map and where... Peru is in the world. Uh, and then it gives you a, a brief overview of what is in the unit so that you can um, plan better. It also tells you what the final project is going to be. And then there's a fill in the chart. Same in every lesson, every every unit, every time. Um, so here, the first reading is about skaters. Um, and it's about indigenous skaters or indigenous people who skate. Um, you read the article, same same format, same format. So the kids who continue with Spanish, <clears throat> excuse me, or French or German or Italian, um, have the same format. So it's comfortable for them. They gain confidence. They know that habla y le will be read and, or speak, talk and read. So it gives them a sense of security. And then they're going to read about Machu Picchu, of course, because we're in Peru. Answer some questions. Uh, there's vocabulary here. This would be the key vocabulary. This is long, so this is the key vocabulary. You might want to do a, um, a vocabulary um, chart. Uh, you know, paper is scarce, and, and we certainly don't want to inundate any place with a lot of paper. So I had the students um, keep a notebook where they could, you know, put things in. But I also had them use a composition book. And that composition book was things like this, vocabulary, important vocabulary. They would write the, the name of the title of the, the reading or the video clip or the audio clip, and then draw the, the vocabulary charts for the important vocabulary. Again, not every word, 
just the important vocabulary. What determines the important vocabulary, whatever the topic is. In this case, I can't hardly read it because it's so small, but uh, una experiencia del turismo. So turismo would be the, the word, the vocabulary word, or I, I really can't read this. Um, restos arqueolo, arqueológicos. Those are the key words for this article. Those are the ones that you know they have to know. Uh, there, I'm sure there are others that they don't know, but that's okay. As long as they have this key vocabulary, because it loses effectiveness if they start writing down every single word they don't know. They have to be able to figure out um, meaning through context. This is the final project for this unit. Um, the context is six members of a collective uh, of a collect of a group um, in your community. Okay. So they want to encourage other people to join their group, <clears throat> excuse me, um, with a, a promotional video. And it tells you what you have to do. The product, the end product will be a video, promotional video. Um, and then they, they have to fill in, not fill in, but do the, um, do the project. And it does incorporate several uh, modes of, of um, communication, which is good because that's what we want. Okay, strategies for improving less listening comprehension in class. Use you as the teacher, <coughs> excuse me, and the students should use as much of the target language as possible every day. As they gain, <coughs> pardon me, as they gain confidence and as they gain um security in themselves, feeling secure in themselves. Um, they should be using that vocabulary in class with you, with the, with them, with their uh, peers, um, so that they become accustomed to using it both verbally and auditorily. Uh, repeat the new vocabulary and phrases in context. A word alone doesn't do it, you know, like audible. If they don't know what audible is and they can't make a connection, um, F, um, etymata, I can't use, I can't think of the word. If they don't know that audible has something to do with arbor or arboretum, then just saying audible is not going to mean a thing to them. So use it in context. El arbol es verde. El arbol es alto. El arbol tiene muchas ramas. Um, or point to the item if you have a picture of a tree or draw one on the board or something. Uh, mimic the words. Be sure that they hear you pronounce them because you are the authority in the classroom. Ask questions using the vocabulary. De que color es el árbol? Use as many visuals as possible. Again, making that connection between the verbal and the, and, and the visual. Um, that makes learning a lot easier. Uh, there are a lot of visual learners in the world today more so probably than when I was in school because of everything that bombards them every day. Uh, play recordings at a slower speed, if possible, two or three times before increasing to a normal speed. Let them gain confidence. Let them be sure that they understand what's being heard before you jack it up to the next speed. Uh, they have to be able to understand what they're listening to or they just go and tune it out. Uh, tell students to focus on the big picture, not the details. If they don't catch a word, that's okay. Keep on going. Uh, have students close their eyes to listen to the audio clip. Why? Because if you close your eyes, you're not distracted by what's going, ar going on around you. So have them close their eyes. That's fine. Um, if they have to answer questions, go over the questions beforehand so that they know what they're listening for. There's nothing worse than listening to something and then being surprised by what the questions are. So, you know, have them, give them that. Uh, we have the same resources in French, German, and Italian. And I'm sure that Sabrina uh, will be able, will be more than happy to send you copies of, uh, or excerpts of anything that you require or request. Um, strategies for improving listening comprehension outside of class. Give the students a copy of the written version of the audio clip with blanks for them to fill in as they listen. These blanks should be key vocabulary or details. Be judicious. You know, start out with maybe two or three blanks in a paragraph. And as they expand, 
their the length of the reading passage or their audio passage, then you can increase the number of blanks. But please don't overload. Do it in steps. Remember that a child when he or she is born is not born knowing anything and or making connections. They're making connections as they grow. So that's what students are doing in our classes. They're making connections and they are toddlers again and learn a little bit at a time. None of us was born knowing everything about a language. We And we tend to forget that as teachers. Uh, play the tape two or three times at first at a slower speed and increase, um, increase the level of difficulty and use graphic organizers. Outside of class, what can they do? Listen to music in the target language. Even though it's fast, I'm amazed at how quickly students pick up the vocabulary and can sing along to a song. Now, I wouldn't start out with, you know, uh, a pop song. Start out with children's music. I can't think of a single one right now, but um, there are, there is music available for children, for toddlers. So start out that way, H help them build their confidence and build their vocabulary and build their self-esteem. Uh, switch your apps to target language. This is something, oh, listen to audiobooks in the target language. Actually, I had some students um, the last couple of years that I taught that I was doing AP, they had they were listening to audiobooks in, in Spanish. They would read along as they heard them or they would play them in the car or whatever, but it improved their listening comprehension a hundredfold. Um, they also, a lot of them were switching their apps on their phones to target language. Um, they were writing text to each other in Spanish. Um, it's just, you know, they're used to doing that. So why not take advantage of those things? Watch TV or movies in the target language. You can use closed captioning at first. There's some controversy about that. Some people say, well, then they're paying attention to the closed captioning. They're not really paying attention to the language. But think back to when you were learning your first or second or third or fourth language. You were concentrating on if you were using co closed captioning, if you are like now, for example, uh, learning a third language or a fourth, and you use the closed captioning. Even though you are using closed captioning, you have a visual and the words are slowly beginning to take part of your brain, take over part of your brain. I would tell my students to listen to the news without closed captioning. Why? Because the news has very vivid images and they could tell what at least the topic was about, even if they didn't understand every single word. Then they could use closed captioning the second time and see how much of it they really understood. So it's it's a game that they have to play uh, and that you can help them with. Uh, look for YouTube videos or commercials in, in the target language. Again, it's the visual and, and audio uh, uh, connection. Watch the news in the target language. Or I just said that. And listen to podcasts. This is for them. So don't assign a podcast on, uh, I don't know, um, I can't even think of a boring topic for me. Um, have them listen to podcasts in things that interest them. And then once they gain that confidence, then they can branch out and learn, uh, listen to podcasts about other things. It's all relative. Uh, to learn to strategies to improve reading comprehension, vocabulary is important, context clues, reiterate to them how important context clues are. In Spanish, we have so many different context clues, the ending of a, of a word, uh, the ending of a verb, the ending of a noun, um, things like that, that, that help them get the gist. Access background knowledge, QWLs, have a list of questions that you have to answer. Give them a list of questions so that they can look at the questions before they start reading. They can figure out the main points and don't, don't trick them. Don't ask little bitty, you know, insignificant nonsense. How many times have you listened to a conversation completely thoroughly, totally concentrated on that? Our minds work so that we get the basic information or the important information, but we have to train ourselves to do that. So as teachers, we have to train our students to do that. The minutia is nice when they're in college, you know, after they finish high school four years and or five or six now with, with 
uh, language being starting in seventh grade, they'll get it. But we don't have to be the ones to 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 do that. You know, we don't have to trick them. We don't have to ask trick questions. Uh, look for the main idea and supporting details. This is a great activity anyway, uh, because they have to be able to distinguish between the main idea or main topic and then the details that support it. Um, make a list and then write a summary. Summary, four or five key sentences. Um, reread it as many times as needed. How many times did I read the chemistry book before I figured out what they were talking about? And visualize what you're reading. Have them draw a picture for heaven's sake. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> and for the visual learner and the artistic student, you're opening a whole new world to them. And I just want to say thank you for coming to this or for attending this session. And I'm done, Sabrina. <laughs> if there are any questions. The first question is if there are specific best practices for assessing students' progress in interpretive skills. And how can these assessments inform instruction? Hmm, best practices. Well, um, I'm going to set that one aside for a minute. I found the last few years I was teaching, and I, I retired 11 and a half years ago. Um, but I, I have my hand in, in education, and I have my hand in, in uh, my fingers in, in several language organizations as well. So, And I attend conferences, and I, I listen. Uh, so best practice I'm going to set aside, but I will say that one of the things that I did the last couple of years that we were teaching, because we had to put our objectives on the board and all of that, one of the things that I learned helped the student the most and helped me the most was the can-do statements that ACTL has, because they can see, they they check their own chart off. I can say good morning. I can say good evening. I mean, I'm being very general and very basic. But that, that helps the student see where he or she is, and that is encouraging. And if, um, you know, if they fill out enough check marks, their confidence just grows and grows, and they realize they can do a lot more. It's also very affirming when they, they see that they can do a lot more than they thought they would be able to do in a month or in, in a quarter, whatever it is. Um, also, and I'm going to put in a plug for... Those of you who are from Florida, I was just reading from where you all are from, and I'm pleased that you're from all over the place, um, even from out of country. That's awesome. Um, for the those of you who are in Florida and who are still classroom teachers, one of the things that excited my students the most all the years that I took them was to attend the Florida State Spanish Conference, which is a competition for students. And I use the word competition loosely because they only compete against themselves. Um, it's broken down into uh, four categories. The student who is just learning Spanish in class, the student who has some outside knowledge, and then there's, a media, there's another one in between, and then the heritage speaker or the native speaker. Um, they compete among themselves in, um, 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 they compete against themselves. Uh, in speaking, in uh, poetry recitation, and in poetry. Those are the academic uh, things. And then there are cultural things too. But that was something that my kids came back, the first few years they came back all excited because they were able to stand and talk about a topic that they had seen before um, for two minutes and get a superior. I mean, can you imagine a student who's just learning a language and in March goes to this, this state thing and meets other kids from all over the state and comes back with a superior, what it does for their self-confidence. And then I never had to worry about getting a full team together because they talked it up so much that I had kids lined up wanting to participate. So if you're in Florida, if you're in Florida, uh, you can reach me through my address here and I will send the information to you. Uh, the next competition is in March, this coming March. Um, but that's something that maybe is a best practice. Um, encourage your students to, to talk as much as you can. Um, what was the second part of that question, Sabrina? See, best specific best practices and how can these assessments inform instruction? 
Okay, so the 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 um, the can do statements can certainly drive your instruction. If you can it out uh, like once a week or every two weeks or at the end of a unit or however you want to do it, you collect those back. And if the child has checked only one box, then there's there's a something missing. So use that as a way to drive instruction. Repeat things. I mean, we always repeat things anyway, but keep repeating things and adding to it so that the the there's more boxes checked. That drives your instruction right there. Reteach, reteach, reteach. Fantastic. Our next question is, how can educators promote independent reading and listening activities outside of the classroom to further develop students' interpretive abilities? That's the million dollar question. I don't have a, a, a cure all for that. Um, hopefully, when the kids start reading, what it's just I'm, I'm trying to put all my thoughts together. Um, how do you get elementary school age children to read? They have to be interested in what they're reading. So if a child, if a student of yours in whatever level it is, expresses an interest in something to you, then find another book, find an, a, a magazine, find a video, help him find these things that will keep his interest going because, you know, we only read what's, what is interesting to us really. And in school, you have to read what you have to read, but outside uh, during the summer or, I, I mean, my gosh, my interest changes like every six months. I, I concentrate on one kind of reading and then I think, okay, I've read enough of that and I jump to something else, but it's because I'm interested in it, not because somebody is standing over me saying, well, you've read enough of X, Y, or Z, you've got to move on. And the same thing in school. If the, if the goal is for them to read and understand, and that's the goal, and be able to communicate with, with the knowledge that they're gaining, then it is better for them to read what they're interested in, in addition to what they have to read, obviously. But reading is reading. Comprehension is comprehension. So if they are reading or listening to something that interests them, that's what's going to move their comprehension up. It's not us saying, today you have to read chapter three of whatever it is. That's true. Our next question is, what role does cultural context play in maximizing interpretive skills? And how can educators integrate cultural components into the teaching? Well, culture is the thing that interests the kids the most, at least in my experience. They want to know all about the food. They want to know all about the music, the dancing, the, the sports. So that already involves the culture. Uh, of course, there are nuances and that's fine. Find, you know, there are all kinds of, of, of videos out there. We have a plethora of, of platforms nowadays. Um, and, and Reporteros has done a really good job of including video clips and audio clips of things that would interest a high school student or a middle school student if they're in Spanish one. Um, besides that, um, you know, again, ask them to, if they come across an interesting article, an interesting video, an interesting song, um, have them give you a copy of whatever it is and then preview it, make sure it's appropriate for classroom um, without discouraging the student. You want them to keep bringing you stuff. But um, again, it's, it's, culture is the thing that they're most anxious about the first day of class when are we having a food day i mean that's the first thing they ask when are we having a food day um something i did at christmas time that kind of brought culture around in a in a very basic way because i started it with spanish one they had to create uh an ornament for our christmas tree and they had to get up and talk about it they they had to make it it had to be made by then they couldn't go out to store or it couldn't go to uh Miami and buy something, you know, that looked Hispanic. No, they had to make it. So that brought out their creativity. I had kids cross stitching. Uh, some did clay works, pottery. I mean, you name it, they did it. So then they had to get up and say this, this, whatever it was, uh, represents the country of X. 
uh, because, and they had to give a cultural or a cultural uh, top, um, uh, oh my God, a cultural, um, some a point, a cultural point about whatever it is that they had chosen. They couldn't just cut out a flag. They wanted to show the flag and why it was X, Y, or Z colors. Then they had to create the flag. They could cross stitch it. They could uh, paint it. They could do whatever, but they couldn't just cut out a picture. So that, it, that piqued their interest as well. The Day of the Dead, if your school allows it, is another good cultural hook. Um, uh, Sp Hispanic Heritage Month, another one, have them, you know, do something cultural about somebody important. And I always said it had to have a positive impact on society. So, you know, that being said. Um, and then at Christmas time, I mean, gosh, uh, make sure that you include all of your students. That is so important because Christmas is so Christian, right? And but Hanukkah is celebrated at the same time of year. The Muslims have a, a, a celebration around around this time. Uh, the Hindus. Uh, make sure that you know your students and include them so that there's inclusivity. And culture will teach itself, basically. And they're hooked. They're hooked on culture much more than anything else. Great. Actually, you went on the line of the same question, which is, <laughs> What about the students that don't celebrate Christmas or then don't share in a specific tradition? How can it be done in those cases? Um, especially at Christmas time, because that's the holiday that, that's most, um, I guess, most celebrated. Uh, I made sure that the, the Muslim children that I had in my class could talk about a Muslim holiday or a Hindu holiday or um a Jewish holiday, whatever it was, I incorporated that. There's, uh, you can do something with uh, quinceañera for, that's a big deal in, in some Hispanic countries, not so much in others, but the Jewish people have a coming of age uh, celebration, bar mitzvah and bat mitzvah, have them talk about that and then compare and contrast. And they're learning about their culture and somebody else's culture and making comparisons and, and, and stuff like that. There's always ways to do it. And it's important that you do it. Do not exclude anyone from your class uh, for any reason is my, my theory. Great. And so far, our last question would be, what are some common challenges that students face when engaging with authentic texts and how can educators help them over overcome these challenges? Hmm. The biggest challenge and the first thing they'll tell you is, I don't understand this. I don't understand what he said. I don't understand what I'm reading. Uh, I just don't understand. That's the biggest challenge. They understand and, and read a lot more than they think they do, for one thing. That's why it's important to scaffold your questions and scaffold your readings and, and audio clips and video clips so that they're gaining confidence with each su subsequent audio clip, video clip, or reading. Um, that's the best answer I can give you. Scaffold. Um, make it so that every student feels confident at some point. Um, and if he's not interested in a topic, unless it's going to be tested, then maybe there's another topic that he or she could tackle that would give them the confidence they need uh, and the interest. And I mean, gosh, if, if the if the objective is for a student to be able to communicate, whether it's verbally or in writing, then, you know, as long as they're using the grammar and the vocabulary that we want them to learn, let them read on the side, not in class, but in, as as a as an alternative assignment, maybe um, something that really interests them, because sooner or later they're going to realize that they read more than they read and understand more than they thought they did. They li they can hear and understand more that they than they think they did. And that's the goal. Communication is the goal. Mistakes are okay. Mistakes are okay. Uh, you know, it's how we learn. And nobody's going to laugh at you and say, ha, 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 you didn't say that right. You know. Of course. And yes, this, that was our last question. Oh, Again. wonderful. Yes. Good questions all. Yes. Yes. Great questions. Great answers. So thank you very much, Linda, again. 
And thank you everyone for joining us. Again, if you have any questions or if there's anything you forgot to mention to Linda, remember you can send us an email to marketing at cletwl.com. You also have Linda's email here. You can send the questions to us and we can forward them as you wish. And again, you will receive all the materials in about a few weeks or less. So thank you very much. And if we don't see you before, happy holidays. Enjoy. Mm -hmm.